Welcome again to our latest iteration of the Diverse Diplomacy Series. We're really excited in honor of uh, Georgetown's Latinx Heritage Month to have two amazing colleagues and friends here to share with us their experience in the State Department. So I will not go into their amazing illustrious bios because that will take like a portion of this entire session, but um, Greg Pardo to my immediate right and David Tegel um, have both been in the State Department each uh, for four and, and for how, how long, Greg? Nine years. Nine month. years almost. So collective over a decade of experience, both in the civil and foreign service, um, to provide um, and share their experiences uh, today. And actually their experiences, not only within State Department, but also before State Department, spanning many continents, uh, demonstrates their incredible experience in policy, but also now here in Washington, how much they've done in um, one of our important employee affinity groups, what we'd like to call HECFA uh, at the State Department, which is uh, an affinity group for Hispanic Americans in foreign policy. So we're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for, for making us. the time. Yeah, thank you. Um, and as we always start out these conversations um, to give in, uh, the students and the, the viewers an honor to understand where you guys are coming from, what inspired you both to, to follow the path of diplomacy and did that come to you naturally and how did that, how did you embark upon your path? Yeah, how do you want to start? Would you like to go first? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I guess, you know, I grew up in the area, but first generation college student. Um, so my parents are both from Bolivia. Um, I had the opportunity to go when I was younger in high school to go visit family there and just really enjoyed, you know, um, experiencing the culture, the language. Um, and I kind of realized, you know, growing up speaking Spanish, it was a kind of an asset to be able to communicate with, um, you know, multiple populations. So, you know, that I think having that skill set of just language from the start kind of, for me, framed what I wanted to do down the road. Um, you know, I think everyone has their own kind of skill set that they can kind of use to effectuate change. Um, and I know, for example, SFS and Georgetown is really focused on public service. Um, and so for me, that was kind of my way of kind of impacting, you know, those around me in society was kind of using those skills. Um, cultural uh, language skills and I think you know State Department work foreign service civil service was kind of a key way to, to do so That's great and Greg you're not from this area so you no. want to share your path it may be well, a little different I'm a proud Texan I'm from San Antonio <laughs> um, from the west side of San Antonio too where a lot of different leaders have come out uh, mm. from current members of Congress even presidential candidates now yeah. HUD secretaries um, I, I think for me it wasn't a natural path. I'm gonna do the uh, yeah, path they, yeah. Uh, my mother's originally from Monterrey, Mexico, and my dad's from uh, Harlingen, Texas. Um, and growing up in, I grew up speaking both English and Spanish. There was yeah. never a time where I only spoke once. It was one language, it was both. And grew up going down to Monterrey every summer, spending a month mm -hmm. with my grandparents there. Um, one, the influence was my, my maternal grandfather, who mm. was always on his off time, always watching uh, politics um, <laughs> on the TV. You know, when uh, Salinas was running, uh, wow. uh, Colosio, when he was running for president. Um, and then he would always, to take me away from playing soccer in the uh, little courtyard <laughs> my grandmother had knocking down her plants, take me with, <laughs> with, to, to like the plaza. And, and he, he was talking politics with his friends. The thing is, having that around and my right. grandmother always saying, oh, he's going to be some type of, he likes, he likes talking a lot, referring to me. <laughs> Uh, I was like, yeah, and I, I liked history, but I never viewed myself as being capable part, enough yeah. of being a part of the political conversation. Right. And now that I look back at it, I always, I was like, oh, that's for somebody who's smarter. Somebody, right. I didn't even consider majoring in international relations when I first entered mm. undergrad, because I was like, oh, those are for folks who, who are smart. Right. Not realizing that, it's like as David was saying, that I grew up translating for my mother when we would go right. to a store to or to uh, a school meeting when I was in trouble <laughs> with a teacher. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't until I was in college, professors taking the time to kind of get you involved in exactly. activities. I also got involved in, the, I, I was in a weird situation where I'm from inner city San Antonio and I went to college in inner city San Antonio, right mm. next to my neighborhood. So it's, it's imagine having Georgetown next to an inner city, wow. Georgetown University. And I saw those disparities right. and, I, and because of that, I started getting involved in the community, either voter registration, volunteer for a couple of campaigns and that's when I was like oh wait a minute I like politics right people the old lady who I'm registering to vote likes me because I also speak Spanish right uh, and during that time I started taking international relations courses uh, 
but I still didn't think foreign service. I right. spent two years in Bangladesh as a volunteer, uh, and I came back. And during my time there, uh, that's when I decided, hey, wait, the government was going through a process. <laughs> it's still going through a process. <laughs> and the military took over for a while. And I was like, wait a minute, diplomacy is important. I, I, I want to be a part of the conversation because I know how this is impacting right. development and everything else. So that's how I ended up coming into the State Department. I also applied for a Wrangell Fellowship, and it was kind of a long journey right. into to this of self-realization and, and realizing, wait a minute, I, I can do this. Right. Yeah. Well, that's actually a great segue to um, on my next question that I think is so important to talk about identity and how we see ourselves, especially as, I mean, all three of us are first generation in the foreign service, or in the foreign affairs community. And whether you're civil service, foreign service, or even just in the public policy field, sometimes you know, you have to have an intentional understanding of how you are perceived by others and, and how you kind of go into each meeting, go into each conversation or into each foreign service assignment, you know, really being aware of how you are perceived. Can you kind of share how that experience has evolved for you? Maybe it started when you were, David, for you, when you were here in Georgetown yourself or and it changed when you joined the civil service or for you, Greg, you know, when you went overseas or come back, how has that kind of been for you? <laughs> oh, good. You know, I've been reflecting a lot on this question, and I think it starts, one, with how you view yourself. Yes. And just thinking of that, oh, wait a minute, I can't, inter when I was 18 or 19, and thinking to myself, oh, I, I'm not capable of studying international relations. That's for somebody who's smarter. Mm. It's like, why is that? Yeah. And, and, uh, and um, oh, when, one, what is society telling you around you? Right. Um, and then the second question is, yeah, you, you, sometimes you do second guess yourself, even when you're at the table. Right. It's like, well, how are people viewing me? Right. Um, and, and so that's something that I think, one, you have to go get over, get past that on your own, right. but then maybe challenge perceptions. Yeah, um, exactly. My first assignment was on the Cuba desk. Uh, I would love to come back to Latin America, and I still, my dream is to travel around South America. Um, but then there's sometimes the assumption that, oh, right. he's, he's Mexican-American or he's Latino. Right. Oh, Perfect for, for Latin <laughs> South America. America. South yeah. America. Yeah. And you're like, wait a minute, I, I, I kind of want to study Arabic or I want to study right. Thai. I, I can do that too. Right. I exactly. can deal with the Middle East uh, plan. And, and so, but it depends on so what perception do people have. Right. Um, and uh, anyway, I mean, you have to overcome that because even yeah. yourself, you doubt yourself. But I don't know. It, yeah, no, completely agree. I think, you know, growing up in the area, like I was always realized I was, you know, the one minority in a lot of my classes, um, you know, going to high school here. And, and even, I mean, even now, I think we'll probably talk a little bit about diversity in, in, in government work policy, but even now you'll, you'll often find yourself in a meeting and look around and, and whether it's, you know, by gender or, or by ethnicity, you're usually, the, you might be one of two people yeah. in the room. Yeah. Um, but like Greg said, it's kind of, it's important just to not, you're kind of aware of that sometimes right. more so than others. Um, but you know, when you realize that those observations that you have are valid and, and um, you know, and that your, your, your perspective is actually a valid perspective, it's, it's really important to kind of have that confidence to, to get past that kind of, you know, feeling of as being another. And it's not just, you know, gender, it's not just ethnicity. Right. I mean, like, if you went to school here, for example, saying, well, I've never lived in D.C. and there are all these people who have students who have interned right. in D.C. before. They kind of know how politics work here. So I'm right. just, you know, I'm from Texas. I'm just going to kind of keep quiet. You know, you do know things. You do have, have value to add to the conversation. So it's really important just to whatever it may be um, to kind of add that, that dimension, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's really great. And it, you already kind of previewed the, the, the topic of how the State Department or maybe just the foreign affairs community writ large um, since kind of the beginning of your career or even before and to now, how do you, how have you seen the evolution of how it um, is trying to tackle um, retaining and attracting diverse and, and inclusive workforce? What are your perspectives? And I think it's important here maybe to highlight what HECFA is, what HECFA does, and, and your, your roles respectively in trying to engage with the rest of the Hispanic American, um, like uh, a form of, for not foreign policy, even just policy community in DC. Yeah. Well, well, HECFA stands for the Hispanic Employees Council for Foreign Affairs Agencies, and it's very long. <laughs> <laughs> it's like HECFA. Branding. <laughs> <laughs> um, started in 1982, but I think 
organizations like HECFA or the Thursday Lunch Group, which is an right. African American group, or yeah. Blacks in Government. Uh, you have GLIFA, which yeah. is the LGBT group. I th I'd mentioned this to uh, an intern a few weeks ago. It's like an institution itself, like this building, like say the School of Foreign Service might not care about you. It's 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 a building. It's it's a name, right. but the people are what makes, makes. it. And we all yeah. know this. We're studying policy or communication, et cetera. You know, and saying that, with that being said, it, I, I think because of it's the people who kind of make the change or who right. make the observations and then speak out and then try to act. And I, I think that the affinity groups have done, and this is going for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, the Thursday lunch group, I'm not sure. Has they, been for decades. For decades. Yeah. I think they're just 40 years. They were starting to come together on Thursdays for lunch right. because... They couldn't get together any other way yeah. to talk about, well, what can we do to bring in more African-Americans into the foreign service? And it's the same thing with HECFA. It's making noise when, or, or, or calling it out when it's like, right now we're, what, uh, Latinos make up 17 to 20 percent, percent of, of the, the American, American population. population. We make up is nowhere near how it is in State five Department. to seven yeah. percent of the State Department. And when you yeah. break that down to foreign service, it's civil really service, other positions, it get those it gets portions smaller, smaller, yeah. And you know that's where it's like the question is what the chicken, and, what comes first, the chicken yeah. or the egg? I mean, are we not recruiting enough, or are right. we doing a good job recruiting, but people are leaving yeah, because exactly. an, an institution doesn't know how to retain people who come from different backgrounds? Um, and and I think because the noise that the affinity groups, as we call ourselves, have been making, the the State Department has been making a lot of attempts and like we, there is a, a state department wide diversity and inclusion group yeah. that works with the different uh, affinity groups and it's trying to figure out okay what how do we one invite people to the dance mm -hmm. but also keep them. ask them to dance yeah, with us ask them to dance engage and stay them in, it's like stay it's, in the dance and to stay in the dance <laughs> uh, and when you do that you really have to make certain changes and to how do you how do you deal with people who do come from another a different region? Maybe right. not everybody thinks like say someone who comes out of Georgetown or GW yeah. or you or Columbia, uh, or the East Coast or yeah. or whatever. Um, so uh, you know affinity groups trying to do a lot of retention programs like whether you do career advancement mm -hmm. activities, uh, teaching people how to deal with the game. Yeah, it, 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 that can be very overwhelming. Yeah. It's like coming to school, grad school for the first. I mean, yeah. in your, the first in your family, right? Yeah. Or even moving to D.C., it's tough. Yeah, so it's tough. we try that and we do a lot of outreach, too, to students. But yeah. yeah, and we've talked a bit about this. I think there's, you know, especially at the state, there's kind of two ways that we've worked to kind of um, increase diversity. You know, there's top-level, high-level policy kind of directives, um, which I think are, are super helpful and kind of lay the groundwork. Um, you know, for example, I work in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, uh, Latin America and, and Canada. And, you know, we, the past year for, for bidding when, when foreign service officers are in this period where they're looking for their next job, um, my bureau, known as WHA, has made a, a big push and, and gone out to say we're looking for, you know, not just every folks who, you know, are Hispanic, for example, or folks who have worked in WHA in the past. We right. really want to diversify and get different perspectives. And so that's super important. It sends an important signal. But, you know, I also think on the bottom end, there's the kind of, um, you know, there's top down, but then the bottom up right. kind of um, right. importance of, of kind of reaching out at every level. And so, you know, for HECFA, I'm the recruitment chair. Um, Greg, you know, really encouraged me to, to do that early this year. And I really have enjoyed it. I think, you know, it's important to, again, at every level, every person to kind of encourage others, you know, regardless of, of background to look into careers in, you know, foreign affairs or, or policy. Um, and, you know, Greg and I have talked a lot about HECFA. Um, you know, and we work a lot with the other affinity groups, like Greg mentioned, and we seek ways to kind of, you know, build on each other's efforts, but but kind of help help one another out because it's really again about bringing diverse perspectives mm -hmm. into government and into the State Department. No, I know that's that's so important, and I think the 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 combination of like almost like dual track uh, efforts, like bottom up and top down, all at the same time. It's very intensive, but you have to have that like multi dimensional yeah. approach to get like yeah. long-term success, right? Yeah, that's where you, you, you as an individual have to make sure you're at the table, right. participating, making your voice heard. And if it's not being heard, make sure people hear it. Right. And, and, and be active because I mean, a top-down approach can only work so so much. Yes. It can only take you so far. Yeah, uh, just paying it forward. I mean, yeah. everything that yes. that yeah. every kind of help you've had by whether it's a coffee with a colleague or with another student, like you you know, everyone is kind of 
this wealth of knowledge and I make a huge effort to always offer my any kind of limited assistance perspective information I can everyone who takes me up on it and reaches out I always make sure to follow up because it's really upon you to, to kind of seek those resources out but it's also upon you to share those resources I think yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, one of the ma major themes that comes up every time we interview someone for this series, um, which I think is so, so important, is the uh, importance of mentorship. And, and, and sometimes in the State Department and the Foreign Service, I'm hearing this term more and more in the diversity and inclusion conversation is sponsorship. <laughs> Can you guys talk a little bit about... Um, you know, how you found a mentor along the way. Um, did, was it intentional? Was it accidental? Um, how have they influenced your career? Did you have a, do you have a mentor and a sponsor? I, I've been in almost as long as Greg and I feel like I'm still learning some of these terms and how I call, I call someone a senior advocate versus a senior mentor versus I don't think I have a sponsor. So, it's, so is a sponsor somebody who buys you coffee or something? I, or? I, think, I, think what I think the intention is, especially in the foreign service process of when you're bidding and you're oh, trying to get your next, con yeah. your next assignment, it still feels like it's such an uphill battle. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes if you have that sponsor, that ambassador who remembers you from that mm -hmm. one assignment and you just gelled, they make sure to bring you along the way mm -hmm. as you go, as they go along in their career and then as you go along. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that just, that is not necessarily a foreign service thing. Yes. I think that applies yeah. writ large. So I just wanted you guys to maybe elaborate on how that has been for you guys. Yeah. I mean, I think there's certainly just kind of natural mentor sponsors that you just develop a good relationship with. You know, there are a couple professors here at Georgetown that just really understood me and, and kind of took the time to kind of, um, you know, just share their research, their kind of wealth of knowledge with me. You know, Elizabeth Whitaker, Betsy Whitaker was a professor here, public diplomacy course, which was a fantastic course. Um, personally, for me at State, I got really fortunate that I started um, as a presidential management fellow, and I started my first assignment in the, the uh, Western Hemisphere Affairs front office, and I worked for uh, a man named Paco Palmieri. Um, he was the acting assistant secretary at the time. Very senior position, very important person, decades of experience, but you know, he, for some reason, just, you know, would always reach out. And, you know, at first he was actually the one who brought me into HECFA um, when I was interning at State before. He said, you know, look at my calendar and, and jump in on this meeting. I want you to join. Um, mm. But I just remember in my first, my very first kind of assignment in at the State Department, um, there would be times where I would be presenting him a memo or giving him something um, that needed his attention, and he would look at me and say, well, what do you think, and would ask my opinion, which, you know, was kind of scary <laughs> at the time, but just to kind of see that he was interested in hearing kind of everyone's yeah. perspective. Um, but, you know, again, and his, his big thing is he's, you know, he's very much in, invested in people, and as a manager of, of, you know, at one point, all of our embassies in, in the Western Hemisphere, he kind of just always would reiterate that point that it's about taking care of people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he didn't really have to say it because he showed it in his actions every day. So mm -hmm. for me, that's been a mentor. Um, you know, I, coincidentally, I'm, I'm now the Honduras desk officer, and he was actually our ambassador nominee for Honduras. Um, about a year ago, and you know we keep in touch now. And and even though we don't have a working relationship, you know there's he still offers me insight and, and, and advice and, and just friendship. So mm. you know I hope it's somebody that I'll I'll keep in touch with. It happened to be somebody senior, yeah. but I also have a couple of other key mentors who are you know perhaps mid level officers. And and you know I also am a huge proponent of kind of peer to peer mentorship. Yes. I yes. think um, you know that's huge. Uh, we often kind of think in terms of age or years of yes. experience. And so I appreciate Greg kind of pushing me along to come to this talk. Cause I was like, you know, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm not an ambassador rank, you know, <laughs> how, what can I say? But I do think, you know, there's something, there's some kind of value in, in yeah. everyone and it's whether it's your classmate, um, it could be an intern in your office, yeah, you've been working exactly. there for years, but exactly. you know, you just, you, you find them in, in, you know, when you're least expecting and yeah. Yeah. yeah those are sure. great topics. What do you think? It's the same thing. I mean, it started with professors back home, like Dr. Larry Hufford or Brother Ed Violet, who took me out to India. He's like, hey, why don't we come out to India and do study development? I was like, sure, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah, because I was going to ask, how did you just come across going to Bangladesh? I was supposed Bangladesh? to go volunteer like, so in random. southern Mexico in Guatacualcos. And then, and then uh, my professor was like, that's going to be too easy for you. Why don't you learn a new language? Why don't you learn Bangla or something? <laughs> and it's like, go to Bangladesh. And of course, my parents are like, like wait, what? What? Where? What? <laughs> Why? Like, <laughs> where? <laughs> uh, but, you know, that encouragement. And then, of course, you find mentors along the way. Even during my time in Bangladesh, you know, I became, some of my mentors were like professors of finance. I've never studied finance. But, <laughs> you know, it's like how, learning how to 
they, they teach you how to guide life at that time, at right. that point in life. Um, and then I, I went to grad school at the LBJ school at UT and had a, uh, the late uh, Dr. Lotus Rhodes. Uh, he was big on just how do you build community within an, an institution? Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of professors, Em and right. Kate Weaver, uh, who kind of really guide you. The State Department's filled with people who always want to be your mentor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask any officer, whether they're civil service <laughs> or foreign service. Maybe it's an overused term yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's not that like, hey, I, are you looking for a mentor? It's not that, <laughs> but it's more of like, you know, you email them and say, can we catch up for coffee? Yeah. And, and sometimes you do have somebody you do have people who take the time yeah, and even true. if they're it's, a, it's a busy person you know they'll meet with you for 15 20 30 minutes yeah. um but you know a lot of people have guided me i mean from my internship when i was in burma richard may to folks right, right now like helen lafave uh mm. uh jeff sexton who recently retired yeah oh wait and, he retired yeah, he retired oh my god yeah so uh, these are the folks who like guide you yeah and and, and it really helps me out and, and and this past year it's like folks within hecfa uh, even a lot of folks who, and, and I thought this was beautiful in a, in a, in a cool way, like we start, we start this diversity and, diversity and inclusion group uh, this past year for the, the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. And, and the folks who were trying to found it were one who is Egyptian American Muslim, me who's like Mexican American Catholic, my friend, another friend who was, grew up in, in, here in uh, McLean who's uh, you know white Jewish guy, and then uh, Indian American who is yeah. Muslim. And, and it's like, oh, this is so cool. This, this is America is, yeah, exactly. coming together to try to figure out how we can make our institution a strong institution yeah. so we can better serve our country. Right, exactly. And like, okay, this is what it is. And, yeah. and, and because of that uh, experience, it, 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 it kind of helped me want to go to work every day. Yeah. Yeah, this is like kind of that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and I think that's like what, what brings you to work every day. I'm kind of just thinking about it now. You know, when you, if you're looking or if you're trying to assess like who are going to be my mentors down the road, I think when you you know, are speaking with someone and you kind of find yourself intrinsically just wanting to make them proud or wanting to really perform to your fullest potential mm. because they saw that in you. Mm. I feel like that's kind of a signifier for a, a really good mentor yes. versus, you know, an yes. external kind of motivation of this person could help guide my career, mm. can give me advice to the next level and, you know, will be key to my kind of career trajectory. Um, Those are such amazing points. Uh, I love that we came up with this conversation topic of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring because I actually never, there was never a term in my mind for it, so now I have one <laughs> when I talk with my friends. Um, because we're, I didn't realize that we're all engaging in it like every day, especially right now as we're all bidding. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that a lot, I mean, for some of you who are students here, I'm sure you have that afternoon coffee at Saxby's where you yeah. just need a vent with yeah. one of your classmates yeah. and you're like, you're I like can't doing believe this it is happening. And you don't even know. Why am I even studying here? Or right. did I choose the right career? Or this is what's happening back home, and right. I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it happens. Yeah. It, it happens every day. Uh, so it's really yeah, important. Yeah, I think the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and I think those characteristics that you talked about, David, about your mentors and yours too, Greg, I think are great because sometimes we look for the right mentor depending on, you know, for so many of us that are type A, we come in and we're like, okay, I want to have a career in this specific bureau or this specific region, mm -hmm. so I need to find, like, you know, the ambassador de la rentes of the, of the world who know this <laughs> field, right? And, and so, and, and it works out well if that ambassador has the time and has the desire and inclination and, you, and also just the characteristics to gel together. Yeah. But I think what you're talking about with the former um, senior bureau official for mm -hmm. WHA, you know, is so great because just asking you when you're in the room, when you yourself don't even think that your opinion is like super important, um, and then I think what you were saying, which I just wanted to reiterate the whole like, oh, well, I'm not smart enough to be in international yeah. relations. I think that's so important to, to harp on because that's the aspect of how we continue to kind of doubt ourselves and like other ourselves when we are in the room. Like no one else is going to us and saying, well, actually, I don't think you have the credentials right now to t talk. It's actually us in our heads telling ourselves, mm -hmm. well, I mean, this guy next to me has been doing this for 20 years, but I haven't. And then I realized, wait, I actually know the region intimately well. Yep. I know like 80% of the languages in this region. Um, I know all the different sociopolitical issues. Yep. Why am I even hesitating to say, well, sir, actually maybe this is not the right perspective. Yeah. Um, but this, I just, that's, that's so great. Yeah, completely. And you know, Especially at, at a, I, you know, I, I'm a Georgetown alum for grad school, and in a place like Georgetown, I think too, it's really 
important to balance kind of humility and, and your own confidence. Um, you know, I remember during kind of the uh, orientation, um, I met a lot of people and, you know, after meeting most of my class, I realized, wow, I just met, you know, 30 to 35 people who have saved the world um, in some way. <laughs> I was like, I, I can't believe that. That's <laughs> incredible. So um, you know, and I, and I was kind of a, a little bit, I guess, more introverted or shy about, you know, my whatever work history or resume. Um, but over the course of, you know, the year, two years, I realized like, oh, actually, I've done some interesting things yeah. in the world and I'm going to do interesting things in the yeah. world. And, um, you know, whether it's underrepresented populations, which I think sometimes do tend to kind of downplay their accomplishments, um, or if you're just kind of introverted, it is important, I think, at a certain point to really kind of feel confident about what you've done and be able to speak mm -hmm. about it, because it is important to have that outward facing, um, you know, kind of just, just perspective. perspective and yeah. to show others that. Um, yeah. On the other side of the coin, it, it is also important to kind of be humble yeah. um, and, you know, be aware that it's, you know, you're, you, you may be looking, I know it's, it's a really stressful kind of environment to be in school um, and to be looking for the job afterwards or the internship during school, but it's also important to kind of recognize that, you know, I, I, people always list Georgetown as it's a great school and it's ranked this and that, but what does that actually mean? You know, right. what, what does a ranking really mean? Um, and, and that's why I think the, the kind of push for diversity is really important. Yeah. Um, the fellowship that I, that I did, the Presidential Management Fellowship, was very big on kind of recruiting from non kind of East Coast universities. And so um, it's, again, because of di diversity of perspectives and, and, and how much that adds to uh, the government, to the conversation, so. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's really great. So kind of a little bit off of that, um, could you maybe share an experience um, in your career thus far where you've been in a policy conversation or you've been in the room where you felt that because of your background, maybe being first generation or being Latino American or you know, a, you know, any of the kind of gamut of being the other in the room where you felt like, I think you kind of alluded to a little bit when you know, someone was asking you about like what your perspective is on a memo, but if you're in a policy conversation, let's say on South and Central Asia or on even Honduras, and did you feel like your opinion was not included or you felt like you were hesitant to, to raise your voice to a policy perhaps that maybe you felt like you knew a little bit more about? Um, but you know, once again, because we doubt ourselves, it sometimes comes into play in being able to you know, make our voices heard. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's hard to, to say. I, I think, I, going back to your, your example of Paco, Palmieri kind of saying, hey, what do you think? Yeah. I think my best managers and leaders and coworkers have been the ones who've said, hey, what do you think, Greg? Right. Or just taking, I think right now when we came in, it's like, could we introduce ourselves? Yeah. And that's important because you also want to know who's, who's in the audience. Right. Like, who am I talking to? What are right. they doing? Are they in grad school and undergrad? I think that's important, but, you know, being neglected, yeah, there's been times where I feel frustrated because it's like, yeah. I actually have five years in that country. Right. Why am I not yeah. being asked? Yeah. And, yeah. and I just don't know why I'm not being asked. Right. So it's, I'm running under assumptions where. That's true. Yeah. Is that person not asking me because they, they think I might not have traveled ever to South Asia? Right. Or, or is it because maybe my degree doesn't have a certain name, mm. uh, you know, from the, maybe from the East Coast? Nothing against the East Coast schools. <laughs> But there's that thought. Like, there's that elite um, yeah. kind of characteristic. I was like, oh, well, yeah. he went to Texas. What does he know outside of Texas? UT Austin. Uh, UT That's Austin. just like a <laughs> random school. <laughs> but, you know, or, or it's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, it can be many assumptions. Um, I've had to make my voice heard, and that, that's what, but it's exhausting. Yeah, it's exhausting. Exhausting not being asked. Yes. And so yes. that's why I make sure that I always come prepared yes. for things. Always come to the table. Now, Yes, I believe in being humble because there's people who are going to reach out to you, but then it doesn't mean being meek. It means yes. sometimes being... The balance there is hard. It's that balance. It's like, okay, I need to make sure I present myself and right. to people take me seriously. Uh, but I mean, I have had the instances where one time I was walking out of a building and people thought I was a driver for the, the oh shuttle bus, right? And I'm like, I am wearing a suit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dang. And, and so it makes me wonder, okay, are people looking at me like that while I'm at the table? Do yeah. they think... Or even being in, in certain parts of the world, right, uh, right. people always assume that I'm one of the locals right. and I'm not Same. the American officer. Yeah. Right. 
it, you know, and you're having to fight that. that and that's frustrating there. That's yeah. where you're like, okay, gosh, I'm going to have to take an extra step to make yes. my voice heard. And yeah. it's like, why do I have to do this? And do I have the energy today, yes. right now? Yes, do I have to the do energy this? today? Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, even just, you know, and it goes, it's a joke. I once sat next to a, a colleague in another U.S. government agency for the length of an hour meeting. And afterwards, um, she'd introduce herself because she thought I was part of the Honduran delegation meeting with them. <laughs> oh it's, just, it's just an aside. I mean, you know, it was, it was just a weird <laughs> seating arrangement. But yeah. um, I think something I, you know, see a lot at, at State in particular is, again, going back to peer-to-peer -peer and kind of respecting those kind of uh, those around you for yeah. their knowledge, not necessarily their years of experience. You know, I, in my office, um, I'm on the younger end of, of employees and officers, a lot of, you know, Foreign Service officers who have been in for a, a decade or so, or, or you know, this is their third career and they have you know twenty some years of experience in other in other work. But um, you know, oftentimes you get kind of you, you get overlooked because you you don't have you know gray hair. And, and, <laughs> and I had someone once say at a think tank that oh, you, she he gave an intern the advice that you know you only need to look for the people with the gray hair in the room. Those are the important people to talk to, what? which I think is just is really unfortunate. I mean, I, I value that decades of experience, terrible. but I do also think as far as being the other, um, you know, having the experience of, of not necessarily feeling like my voice had been heard right. um, because of I looked younger or because I, you know, might not have had as many years of experience. And like Greg said, you know, the way it took me a bit in this, you know, new role to get comfortable with the work. But, you know, after a few few months of that, you know, it was really just being prepared. And, you know, I had a, a meeting again um, where we were meeting with an outside group and, and the, the man had made some comment about, you know, we're supporting, their, their company was supporting kind of um, security, like national police officers. And he said, oh yeah, we have, you know, kids we work with just right out of the academy, you know, not much older than you. And it was the most, you know, condescending oh. comment. And I was like, well, oh. I, I have, you know, about a, a decade of experience. I realize <laughs> I've been at state for this many years and I know this much about the country. And so what I did was I, I just, you know, obviously don't take any offense to it, but I responded with a really, you know, in my opinion, well-informed answer and kind of, yeah. you just have to know ins and outs. And sometimes you may have to work harder um, than others and it, it is tiring, but it's, it's kind of the best you can do. Yeah, yeah. no, those, yeah, I mean, so many moments. And I think it depends also. So sometimes for me, my experience is my maiden name is very clearly Muslim. And so when I'm working on issues related to Muslim majority communities, um, it's like it's either one or the other where they either like immediately go to me um, uh, because of my Muslim name. And I'm like, well, great, because I happen to actually care about this field. But I'd rather that you not make that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. assumption or it's the opposite where I look young and so they don't even go to me at all and then I'm like fighting to have my voice heard about something that I'm like, well, actually I grew up in a community that has been facing this issue like since I've been born. Mm -hmm. And so like technically I have like decades of experience in this field, but how do you market like personal experience because that's not ever something you put on a resume, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think in our communities that's part of it and how we even the balance between meek and humility and just showing the your in your impressive CV. It's like, mm -hmm. it's hard to manage all of that. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, and, and sometimes even, even minority groups are guilty of this, but not taking the time to understand where that other person's coming from. Right. What does it mean to be from the west side of San Antonio or yeah. from East LA or from Alexandria, Virginia, uh, or Northeast DC or Southeast DC? Right. Um, what does that mean? Uh, how is it there? Um, but making that effort, um, there were, and also just being tactful. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about an incident, if I remembered, there was a conversation talking about a Mexican-American mariachi group going to a certain part of the world uh, as a kind of like a cultural, cultural envoy. envoy. Yeah. Now, that part of the world was not an, under my portfolio at all. There was a debate going on on how, if was this American or not. And of course, you go to Stanford, you go to anywhere, even down to 14th Street, I for, or I forgot, which near um, uh, Adams, Adams Morgan. I don't know, I saw a mariachi group. And <laughs> I know they're from DC. Um, Stanford has had their mariachi group since 1993. Oh, wow. Uh, there's an all women's mariachi group from New York. Wow. Anyway, I, as someone who works at the State Department, you should take the time to research how long have mariachis been, been in the United States? And are part of our culture. Ex exactly. Instead of, and all throughout the Southwest and everything, instead of, they looped me in. To a say, conversation. To a conversation. Well, Greg, making the kind of indirect um, 
uh, assumption. assumption that, well, he's Mexican. Can you tell us? Oh and I was, like, and I didn't know how I feel. I was like, okay, well, it's good that they're asking me about mariachis because maybe I can provide my expertise, uh, Vicente <laughs> Fernandez or something. <laughs> but I was like, wait a minute. Why? Why, the, do, why would you know? Like, yeah. what, I mean, like, why is the assumption yeah, like, that you why? would know about mariachis? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, why? And, and, and it, it got me thinking, and I guess this goes back, like, you know, racism or discrimination or colorism or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to be direct. It's yeah. just the way yes. people view you or the way you treat others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or the way you respond to others. And, and, and that's something that's so important even your, for yourself. Yeah. It's like, okay, am I making this assumption just because this person is a woman, she happens to be LGBT, or maybe this is a person who happens to be Jewish, so maybe I should just ask them this question yeah. before doing my homework. Right. And, and it's, that's what turns people off. Because yes. then if you don't have a strong community around you of friends right. or colleagues or yeah. mentors, that can slowly turn you off. And yes, you say, you know what, absolutely. I don't feel at home here. Yeah, that's exactly it's right. It's a community, right? Yeah. I, I'm going to go somewhere else. That's exactly right. And that goes right. back to the retention aspect, which is so important. So, yeah, that's the final question that we ask all of our um, speakers, which is a little bit more forward thinking. Um, and then we'll go into students' questions. Um, but, you know, what do you think the State Department or just the policy community could be or should be doing to advance diversity and inclusion. I think, in my mind, the first thing I think about from this conversation is do not tell interns, look for the person with the gray hair in the room. <laughs> That's like on the do not list. Um, but maybe on the do list, I like some of the concepts we talked about, about humility and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, but maybe a little bit more. I don't know what other thoughts you guys have. And as maybe through HECFA and your advocacy work, do you see, like, the future of attracting and retaining more Hispanic American talent at state, yeah. you know, what does that look like? I actually was surprised to find how, in my mind, the numbers look really, really sad yeah. for the Hispanic American community. And they haven't at changed state for a long time. Yeah, and the rate <laughs> of I mean, change we're, we're, is really bad. We're working on it, but it's like we're still trying to figure out: Are we leaving? Yeah. At high numbers, or are we not attracting attracting enough? And yeah. and, and you know, that's when the you know having a degree in or expertise in data analytics helps, it's but, huge, yeah. uh, but um, I think the important thing is that one, you also don't want to, if you want to approach and create a diverse, it's two, it's two prong, right? Diversity yeah. and inclusion, inclusion and engaging with folks, but the diversity aspect, you also just can't go like, hey, you happen to be Latino or you happen to be Asian <laughs> yeah. or you're a woman. Yeah, quotas don't or, work. Yeah, quotas <laughs> don't work. And, 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 and the thing is you also don't want to be like, you don't want to feel like I was selected for this because I'm that yeah. one Latino. Yeah. Um, it's like I, I, I have skills. I know how to speak yeah. Hindi. I know about yeah. X, Y, Z. I don't know. Uh, I, I think as an institution, even for us, it's like, okay, how do we partner with HR? And mm. HR is also doing this, uh, yeah. on uh, doing outreach yes. You know, within DC. And how do we go and do outreach to places that we don't usually do outreach right. at? Like in Arizona or Texas or New Mexico or Utah, right. uh, you know, Florida. Or somewhere, Dakota, you know, <laughs> one of the Dakotas. Like one of the Dakotas. <laughs> Idaho. But just going out there and reaching out, uh, using your affinity groups. We're yeah. connected to folks who happen to be Hispanic. And it's a good way to, like, connect. Yeah. And you bring folks in. And, and sometimes, you know, yeah, you know, an, a young student, uh, a young, uh, you know, Latina who's in Chicago, if she meets somebody who is also a Latina from Chicago, yeah. it's going to be a huge impact. But yeah. also, even if you're not Latino or Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, being able to connect with somebody who's doing something that you like, right? It's great. Yeah, that's you know, that's uh, it. and I think that's just the way you have to approach it as well. Like, using your resources. So, like, if you're trying to recruit more underrepresented groups to to the school foreign service, it's like, are you connecting to different organizations around the the country right. that work with underrepresented communities? Right. And, and and just see if you can and start talking to them. Right. Exactly. I, I should have applied to Georgetown. I was yeah. again. I was still thinking of the. Well, I don't know if I'm made for Georgetown. Yeah. Why well, I love and proud to be a Longhorn. Yeah. It's also like, okay, why do I, why did I limit myself? Put yourself at least for up for to consideration. More. To more, right? And yeah. I still would have gone to UT. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but uh, but still, like making that effort. Uh, yeah. and, and then once you have people here, not only does the institution have to help, you know, you need support from the top. Yes. Because that's it's what both. encourages the people who it's are both. working from from the bottom up. Yeah. But also engaging, making sure that keeping the leadership accountable, yes. and you're recruiting people, mentoring students. Yeah. I've mentored students who are, this past summer who were Latino, Indian, American, uh, 
white American and somebody from rural Southwest Virginia. It was a great guy. <laughs> Two different worlds that we came from, yeah. but we're able to connect. And I think that's really important to retain yeah. talent. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm just, I mean, briefly, just, I definitely think, you know, the conversation is, is happening. I'm, you know, only been in state for four years, so I can't speak to before, but I feel like the conversation is, is starting to happen in, in, in very significant way. And there are certain initiatives from HR um, that, you know, we have been started targeting diversity. So that's having the conversation yeah. is the first step. Yeah. I think that's super important. I think the fact that yeah. everyone is here right now, um, just chatting with us is, is very important. And then again, just to the second part, I'm a huge proponent of kind of grassroots, yes. um, kind of everyone at every level taking yes. every opportunity to yes. recruit yes. others. Um, and there's just so many people when you ask them, like, how did you end up at state? How did you end up at government? How did you end up at Georgetown or at you know UT? It's all because of a chance encounter with one person yes. who yep. took the time yes. to kind of share with them their experience or to give them a little bit of confidence. And it was in my case applying to Georgetown. Someone said, you know what? You would be a great candidate for, for SFS. Um, and I was like, wow, never actually thought about that. Um, so, you know, even for all you here helping out your colleagues, whether they're, you know, applying to grad school, um, helping out, you know, with in, in, uh, students who are interested in Georgetown, just kind of really everyone needs to really take on that role in themselves. Yeah. Saying that, I, and I go over in a segue. You know, it's also all by accident that I'm even here. <laughs> I was in high school, in summer school, going into my classroom, and my advisor, Mr. John Wilkerson, stops me. He's like, hey, Greg, because I really wanted to become a firefighter. My brother is the one who became the firefighter. <laughs> he's, he's proud of that. I was like, I'm going to do firefighting. And my advisor stops me. He's like, hey, Greg, you have a pretty good GPA. You've raised your grades a lot from you know, freshman year. And I was like, yeah. He's like, why don't you just go to a four-year university? And I was like, and this is, you know, Right, right in the summer between my junior and senior year. Wow. I was like, really? He was like, yeah. You've taken your SATs? I was like, yeah, you had us take our SATs. He was really <laughs> adamant. You should go to four-year university. Right after that, I was like, I'm going to go to college. And it's wow. not that I wasn't going to go. I was probably going to go. I was thinking, maybe I'll just go to a community college, and I'll see yeah. where it goes from there. But wow. That one moment. That one yeah. moment. <laughs> and I still think back to that. I was like, and that kid who wanted to be a firefighter <laughs> is like here now in Georgetown talking to a group about foreign service. <laughs> it's like, how did that happen? So I think it goes back to what David said, like even for yourselves, like reaching out to somebody and you're never yeah. told to be mentored. And you're yeah. never. Yeah, and, it's and never you, an explicit thing. Like no one got a, like a handbook no, when we joined. But it just kind of, the second you embark into a, su such an elite institution and, a, and an amazing career of public service, yeah. you, all, you don't even realize that you're catapulted into this different yeah. stratosphere yeah. almost. And you're never um, too young to mentor either. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah. I absolutely agree with that. Well, that is amazing. So many things to ponder. Um, we'll leave some time now for questions from our students and colleagues here. Um, and we'll just have a mic. So if you want to raise your hand and if you have a question, just wait for it. Yes, great. We'll start here and then go around. And just in briefly introduce yourself again. Okay. Hello? Yeah, you won't hear it. It's fine. Oh. Um. Hi, thank you again for speaking with us. Uh, my name is Bethany Johnson. I'm a graduate student here um, at the School of Foreign Service Security Studies. Um, my question revolves kind of on, and you touched on it a little bit, what it's like kind of going abroad and maybe not being everyone's ideal mm. American um, for multiple different reasons or being the idea of some what people think of as a diplomat or a foreign service officer, whether you're young from a different minority, mm. um, but kind of dealing with not only the biases in state, but abroad as you're representing America. If you could talk yeah, on that a little yeah. bit or any stories you've heard. Yeah, so great. I, I, yeah, it's a great question. The globe, the world it, as a whole is <laughs> the whole guilty of being yeah. biased. Yes. Uh, yeah, many times when I've served abroad, whether it's in South Asia or other places, I've had to deal with, well, can I talk to the real American? Yeah. I, I, had to deal, I had that incident. Everybody's going to have it. Yeah. If you're at the concert window. My you know, first tour, I had it. It's like, all right, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the yeah. American. Yeah. Um, people making the assumption that I was escorting the person that was with yeah. me who is not, you know, who's white, for example. And I was like, and they're like, no, 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 he, he's a, di they're like, no, he's a diplomat, not me. Uh, it was frustrating. Now, there's times where you can make, t take it into a teaching moment. Like, wait a minute, yeah. there's a lot of people in the United States and very diverse. There's yeah. 
groups from all over the world. Uh, there's Bangladeshi Americans, there's um, Ooh, that's me. Arab <laughs> Americans, there's people who are Indian Americans. And I always use that as a teaching moment. Uh, and yeah. and then it, it helped them guys like, oh wow, that wouldn't happen in our country necessarily. Mm. That's great. So you can actually use that as a teaching moment. And there's other times where I was just frustrated. Yeah. I was like, seriously, I, yeah. <laughs> did you really, you were gonna treat me differently because you thought I was a local, which, which for me, we were, compa you know, we're, maybe a brother or sister, but you would treat me differently. Right. Because, and, you know, I had those moments. But those biases are around there, but it, it's, it can be draining, though. Yeah. I, you know, so as part of the fellowship, I was posted at an embassy overseas last year, and I traveled a lot for work um, with NGO or Jet before. So, so I, I like, that's a great question, but I, I love it because that's really the crux of the Foreign Service. That's why we have yeah. the Foreign Service, is yeah. to kind of demonstrate American values abroad and to kind of show what those values are. And I think that's why it's so important, again, to recruit so many different people because yeah. every single interaction, like Greg said, is kind of a teaching moment. And it's just, you, it could be the most minute thing, you know, the fact that, you know, oh, Americans like soccer. Oh, I didn't know that because, you know, in Europe, it's, you know, we think it's all football and baseball or, or something like yeah. that. And it really just shows how diverse, you know, the, the U.S. is. Um, so, you know, for me, that's kind of why I'm at State, and that's what I, I love doing. Um, I'm, it can be tiring, but it's mm -hmm. kind of this, it's kind of in my mind, this really interesting challenge um, when you are overseas. And every time, you know, you do get that kind of, you know, negative experience, I kind of just see it again as a challenge, and I kind of smirk a little bit and just, you know, <laughs> say, like, well, actually, I, you want to speak with the real American? Well, that's me. I, I am. So let's have the We're conversation like, again. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think that's great, and um, yeah, and in my and same, I've been in as long as Greg, and every tour is different. Um, and I, one thing I wanted to add is that uh, I have learned humility in understanding history of different countries. Mm -hmm. um, in the U.S., I think I, you know, being born and raised in New York, already an impatient person, <laughs> and so I expect because in America, I think one of the ethos that I at least have developed is that like we always expect more from our country, and I think uh, every time I travel to a different country, I would immediately like my first thing is to apply that same mentality to that country. And then I had to ha have a moment if, if it's after a, you know, a disturbing experience or just like you know a very like haphazard comment that they don't even realize that they said something that was kind of racist or sexist to me um, or Islamophobic. Um, then I have to like first I go through like the anger or whatever, all the different emotions. And then you figure out if you smirk to it or you say something or you figure out like a cheeky comment. Uh, and then then I have to have a moment where I am like, OK, I'm in a country where they have literally never met like a brown woman before. Um, and then that brown woman is actually from America. Like it is just so weird for them because women are not even in like, not even just government, just like in the public sphere. And so it's a little bit of like a humility and an exercise of, oh, well, isn't it great? And you know, for me as a first generation as well, and being, a, my parents are immigrants, they came here in the late 70s um, from, you know, from Bangladesh, from a poor country. And I remember, oh, that's what makes America so great. Like I quickly got it, uh, attuned to like being able to do anything I want because I can. Um, but in all these other countries, like being a brown Muslim woman and, and being in like an elite field considered like in diplomacy, like this is just like they've never, like they've literally never met someone like me before. And so it's like a little bit, you know, I'm not saying like every moment is different. I've had the moment in the consular window and they're like, I want the real American. And I just like look at them like, well, I'm your real American and I'm the one deciding on your visa today. And it has a little bit of satisfaction. Um, and then there are other moments where you're like, I just don't want to do this today. So I just say that to say like it is like it's like a whole gradient of reactions and yeah. you kind of just decide that day how you're going to be able to deal with it. But I think we all deal with it. Um, but that's a great question. Uh, I think you had a question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just for the mic. Thank you. My name is Madeline. I'm in the School of Foreign Service, um, an undergraduate, and I'm a senior this year. And I was wondering if you could talk You're a little bit. There. Yeah, congrats. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your paths after grad school and how mm. exactly you got to the State Department. I think maybe you brought it up a little bit. Yeah. But. Just curious. want to start. So uh, I'm a Wrangell Fellow, and um, you want to talk a little bit what that means. So Wrangell International Fellowship, Pickering International Fellowship, and Payne International Fellowship. I just made a pitch for y'all. Uh. <laughs> uh, the three fellows. The yeah. three fellows. Uh, Payne is for USAID, yeah. Pickering and Wrangell for the State Department. Um, 
if you are think so they're made to kind of create a, to target underrepresented groups and to help with the diversity of the State Department and our USAID. And it's not just ethnic no, uh, it's and gender regional, based diversity, like, like e economic, economic, socioeconomic, socioeconomic everything, literally everything. Sexual orientation, yes. uh, region, yeah. you know, everything. Um, if you apply for it, then they will help pay, they'll provide a scholarship for grad school and uh, then you get into the Foreign Service or State Department at USAID for, and you have to do five years. Um, for the Wrangell, I, that's the one I did in 2008, I, you have to do a congressional fo uh, fellowship the summer before you start grad school and then the following summer you do an internship at an embassy and I did it in Burma or Myanmar. Uh, Pickering, you don't do your first internship until the next summer. summer. You do that at the State Department and then the, the following internship you do at uh, um, at an embassy. So I had applied for that. I, after I got back from Bangladesh, I worked for a while for my old boss. Uh, he was a state representative at the time, uh, Joaquin Castro. And, and then I... <laughs> oh, just like some random person. Yeah, some random guy. <laughs> um, and then I was like, hey, I'm sorry. I know I just started working here, but I have this great opportunity. Uh, <laughs> and so I left and then I did grad school. And I, so from then it's been um, Cuban Affairs, New Delhi, Kolkata, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and then now Israel-Palestinian Affairs. And so. Just not staying bored, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, David, you want to talk a little bit, I, I mean, I know yeah. PMF is widely known, but actually I didn't really know what the PMF was. Yeah, um, yeah another type of fellowship. It's um, intended for graduate students who are interested in pursuing careers in federal government, not just State Department, not just USAID, kind of across government. So you apply in your second year of grad school, um, and there's kind of a, an a essay process, application process, resume. Um, but from there, you know, once you're selected, you're basically um, offered a pool of kind of jobs across the, the government that you can apply for. And they give you kind of a career path within whatever agency you're in. And there's some development assignments within it um, where you, like I mentioned, you know, for example, I rotated to an embassy overseas. You also have a certain number of training hours you need to fulfill each year. Um, and then it kind of puts you on a path towards, um, you know, a leadership position in theory in government. Um, there's also, I would say, internships, you know, the, the regular unpaid internship for the State Department if you're interested in state, uh, definitely worth applying to. Um, you know, I did that as a graduate student actually here. So there's un undergraduate, graduate students. Um, there's paid internships as well. Um, there's obviously the Foreign Service exam, which is kind of the re regular process to get in. And, and, and um, there's a lot more information on that on, on the State Department's website. Um, and civil service as well, there, there are certain ways to, to get in. Um, I'd say if you're interested in State Department, uh, there's a diplomat in residence for kind of yeah. each geographic area in the US. So I would recommend meeting with them. They, they're kind of, their job is to kind of recruit people and to get yeah. them interested in, in to join State. And so they can offer you all of these kinds of resources and, and more. And you know, the, the nice thing about being at Georgetown is that you're kind of walking in the hallways with a lot of these yeah. either former or current um, kind of uh, department officials, um, Charlena, Ambassador De Laurentiis, and so definitely with just every conversation having with them, they can yeah. point you in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, and that's it. That's a wrap. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.